Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. It's great to be with you all after a couple week absence here. Pleased to have our guest back on, friend of the show, uh, apologist Ken Litchfield. He's the author of How Old Is Your Church? Ken, it's been a while. How have you been? I'm doing well. How's William? I'm doing well. It's it, Things are going well here in Arizona, and uh, the teaching thing is going well, and, you know, thanks be to God, and, you know, just plugging along. But I'm really glad to have you back on the show to discuss our topic, which is the magisterium. But before we do that, what's been... What's been going on with you and the apologetics world as of late? Any appearances or anything you want to share with anyone? Sure. Well, I was on uh, um, Gary's show on Wednesday this past week. Uh, actually, it was Tuesday, yeah. And then I did a show with Bill Sauber um, last Thursday, or a week ago last Thursday. Uh, he does Catholic Table Talk, so check him okay. out. And, uh, and the... Uh, the battle in the trenches wages on on Facebook, so there's always uh, always stuff to do there. <laughs> <laughs> always, and for those who don't follow Ken on Facebook or aren't in any of these groups, whenever someone comes with a question, you always list this very detailed answer. Um, that's very helpful. You, you list historical resources, scripture, all that's in there, so it's really appreciated. I think anyone who who's in there appreciates it. So great job on that. Yeah. Also on the uh, coming home network. I'm also part of that. <laughs> yeah. And there was uh, a lady who's a Baptist who's uh, coming into the church and, you know, she was wanting a concise um, summary of how, you know, Catholics re view salvation because she had been in a free will Baptist church where they teach that you can lose your salvation. And now she's in a, um, a different Baptist church where they teach you can't lose your salvation, but she still believes you can lose your salvation. So she was wondering about, you know, how what does the Catholic church teaches? So I put up my uh, concise version of how the Catholic church views salvation um, and that, you know, we are saved initially at one point in time we can lose our salvation, but we can also have our salvation uh, renewed again through confession. And uh, then if we persevere until the end, we can be saved. Yeah, and, and I think uh, that really helped her out. Now, and I'm sorry, this is off topic for what we're talking about today, but <laughs> is there, so, but I think it's very interesting. You think there's a lot of similarity between that and what the free will Baptists kind of believe? I think so. I mean, the the Bible is very clear that you can lose your salvation. And it's not just clear from Jesus and Peter and things like that. It's right there in Paul, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 5. Paul tells the those two Christian communities that if you commit these sins, you will not see heaven. Um, and yet, you know, People have a narrow view of some verses of the Bible that say, you know, you're guaranteed salvation, basically. Uh, and so they stick with only that part of the Bible. But right. Jesus tells us we have to keep the Ten Commandments. And, you know, Paul says, commit these sins, you're not going to heaven. Well, I know my own personal journey, having read, when I first read Hebrews chapter 6, which is very explicit with that as well, that was kind of a turning point for me. But let's go on to our topic today, because although it's a good tangent right on the top of the show, I, th I think it's a very interesting tangent. But our topic today is the magisterium, and I think that's a stumbling block for a lot of Protestants who may be coming into the church. Um, so can you tell us exactly what the, what is the magisterium? Let's start there. Okay, well, still, we'll start with a basic definition of the magisterium. The magisterium is the teaching authority of the Catholic Church, especially as given by the bishops and the Pope, it is the official and authoritative teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And you can kind of include the catechism along with that because what is taught in the catechism is what the Catholic Church teaches. And you can find bishops and priests and probably deacons, not that I know of any, that you know will kind of twist what the Catholic Church teaches and give their own opinion and twist to what the Catholic Church actually teaches. So 
when you hear something that sounds funky, check the catechism. That's what the church teaches. And you would do well to, you know, let the person that was teaching you the wrong stuff, you know, what the Catholic Church teaches, give them the catechism references, because we don't want people to teach the wrong stuff. And right. whenever I'm teaching about the Catholic faith, I'm perfectly willing to be corrected by somebody who can show me authoritative teaching from the Catholic Church that says something different than what I say. And I also tell people that if you disagree with what I say, check the catechism. Whatever one, um, you know, if I agree with the catechism, then you can believe me. But what it teaches in the catechism is what you should believe. If your understanding of what I said doesn't match the catechism, go with the catechism. Because it's the Catholic Church. It's not Ken's church. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I agree. Now, you said the teaching authority of the priests and bishops. Is this something that is, and I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here a little bit, is that something that's scriptural? Is it something that could be backed up by history? Uh, how's that work? Oh, there's plenty of scripture behind this. <laughs> um, but the other thing is, like, I wanted to also establish that Please. everybody has a magisterium. You know, whether it's mm -hmm. for that individual, it's the pope or a bishop or a priest, or for Protestants, you know, a famous Protestant theologian, their local pastor, or for some people, the magisterium is that individual, their opinion of what they think the Bible teaches, they are their own Pope. Uh, but did Jesus tell us, you know, everybody just get a copy of the Bible, read it for yourself, and then whatever you understand from the Bible, that's what it means. <laughs> that's what you can believe. Uh, but Jesus didn't leave a Bible behind. He didn't instruct his apostles to give everybody a copy of the Bible and let them decide for themselves. Um, when Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church, he thought that the Bible was so clear that everybody would understand it the way he understood it, and was very surprised by the end of his life that, you know, all these other people don't understand the Bible like he does. And, you know, he thought that it was his understanding was perfectly clear, but it's not, because the New Testament especially is very small, and a lot of people get it wrong yeah what am what am i oh sorry to I, jump in one of my sure. one of my uh i don't want to say a favorite story but one of the stories that I always find interesting about martin luther and the reformers is shortly after the reformation him calvin and zwigley get together and they're talking about the real presence and this is shortly after the reformation started and there was disagreement already and martin luther's like it's so plain how can you not see it Okay, and anyway, I jumped in there. I'm sorry. That was yep, a no little, side, little side note. <laughs> yep. yep. The, I think that's the colloquy at uh, Mar Marburg or something yes, like that. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. And, uh, you know, Martin Luther said, you know, it plainly says Jesus says, this is my body. And, and Zwingli is like, oh, no, it's all symbolic. <laughs> right. <laughs> so as soon as some guy starts deciding what the Bible says, it falls apart. But the idea of the magisterium goes all the way back, way back to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Oh. Uh, in Genesis chapters uh, 37 and then 39 through 45, uh, let's see, Joseph, who was one of Jacob's 12 sons, who was the son, and Jacob, let's see, yeah. Jacob is the son of Isaac, who's the son of Abraham. So we start with Abraham. God calls him to leave the land of Ur. And then he has a son, Isaac. And Isaac has a son, Jacob. And Jacob has a son, Joseph. Uh, Jacob also had 11 other sons. Uh, but Joseph was sold by his brothers to uh, slave traders and eventually ended up in Egypt, and the Egyptian pharaoh made him governor over Egypt. And because he wisely rationed the country's produce in preparation for famine. And eventually, um, 
Joseph brought his brothers and father to the land of Egypt, uh, which is how the Israelites ended up in Egypt. When we watched the movie, The Ten Commandments, and the Israelites are leaving Egypt, and you're wondering, well, how did they ever end up there in the first place? This is how they ended up there. Joseph brought his family to Egypt because that's where the food was. So, uh, Joseph is often seen as an Old Testament prefiguration for Christ because he was wise and authoritative there in Egypt. And then when Moses comes along and he frees the Israelites from Egypt, and God has him write down the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Moses is the second Old Testament prefiguration of Christ. And then David is the third uh, Old Testament prefiguration of Christ, uh, who's much later on. Uh, and God promises David that he will always have a successor to David on the throne of Israel. Uh, and then Solomon is the first successor of David in the kingdom of Israel. But after Solomon, the kingdom of Israel breaks up into two parts. There's northern Israel and southern Israel. The southern part has Judah and Benjamin. Um, and David is from the tribe of Benjamin and Jesus is, you know, um, his lineage goes back to David and the tribe of Benjamin. But the tribe of Benjamin was very small and relatively insignificant. Judah was the main tribe in southern Israel. And that's why Jews today are called Jews after Judah. They're not called Benjamins. <laughs> That'd be confusing. <laughs> right. So at the time of Jesus, the Jews had three main offices in the religion. Uh, now in the temple, there was the high priest, the other temple priests, and the Sanhedrin. And the high priest was the guy in charge of all the priests. The temple priests were the ones doing the sacrifices at the temple. And then they had the Sanhedrin, which would include the high priests, the temple priests, and other um, rabbis in the area, and, and other Jewish men that knew the law of Israel. And they would uh, advise the Jewish religion and um, judge Jews that had committed sins against the Jewish church or the Jewish religion, yes. And that's why when Jesus is brought to the Sanhedrin, um, let's see, on Thursday, if I recall correctly, um, the, he's judged there. So that's where the Sanhedrin fits in. Okay. And then the local Jewish communities had, uh, they had their synagogue, which was kind of like their local temple, but it wasn't really a temple like the temple in Jerusalem but it was the place where they went to worship the Jews outside of Jerusalem. And at the synagogue, there was the ruler of the synagogue, who was like the head of the place, and he could be a rabbi, or sometimes the ruler of the synagogue was uh, an honorary title that given to the guy who founded that synagogue or contributed a lot of money to build their local synagogue. And then there was a servant of the synagogue um, who was like the assistant to the the ruler of the synagogue or the local rabbi. He took care of, you know, everyday education in the synagogue and the everyday running of the synagogue. And they also had local Sanhedrins because, you know, every time there's a dispute, you need some place to work this out. And you don't want to have to, everybody have to go to Jerusalem every time there's a dispute. So they would have their local Sanhedrin. It's kind of like our local court system. You know, you can do your, file your case in your county court, then you can go to the state court, the Supreme Court of your state, and on up the line. Okay. 
everything doesn't go to the Supreme Court. So we have this basis that the apostles, the Jews at the time of Jesus, they understood this is how a church is run. This is their magisterium. So in the New Testament, uh, the book of Revelation tells us that Jesus sits on the throne of David in heaven. So we know that Jesus is the successor of David, but the Catholic Church is set up much like um, Israel at the time of um, David and then Solomon. In Isaiah chapter 22, we learn that a successor of King David named Hezekiah has a minister named Shebna who is replaced by Eliakim. And the authority of Shebna's office is shown by the robe he wears and the key he carries because Shebna was the assistant to the king. And Eliakim replaces him because Shebna was a bad guy. So you'll find that in Isaiah chapter 22. Uh, read the whole story if you want all the details, but we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> But the authority of that office is shown by the robe he wears and the key. So, Jesus and the apostles are all Jews. So, when Jesus says to Peter that he was giving them the keys of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 16, they recognize the authority of a minister from the dynasty of King David. You know, it's a very natural connection for them because they know their Jewish history. Right. They know their Jewish religion. Um, modern Americans, you know, just reading the Bible, they read that and it's like, well, okay, he's getting some keys, you know, but then Jesus has the keys in heaven too. So. And it all like, factors in with the Jewish roots of our faith. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You, you have to understand Judaism to get the New Testament right. And then when you do that, you find out that it's Catholic. It's not right. Protestant. <laughs> So, um, let's see, da, 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 da. where was I? Yeah. So, um, when Jesus gives Peter the keys, again, it's the, the apostles are thinking like, you know, this is an office and this is the guy who's holding the office. And just like in the Jewish kingdom under the dynasty of David, there will be successors in these offices. It's not a one and done kind of thing. Um, for some Protestants, they might think that, you know, okay, there was the apostles and they had authority, but then they wrote the, the New Testament and, you know, these guys no longer have authority because we now have the New Testament. That's, that's not the way it worked. Um, didn't work that way in the Jewish kingdom. Doesn't work that way in the New Testament kingdom either. Uh, so when Jesus ascends into heaven, uh, he leaves Peter and the apostles behind. And in Matthew 28, you know, he tells them to go out and teach and baptize and promises to be with them until the end of the age. He also tells them, you know, he will send them the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we see how that figures in a little bit later. Uh, so in Acts chapter 1, um, you know, this was shortly after Jesus ascended into heaven. Peter and the rest of the apostles, the other 11, they meet to replace Judas because they recognize that Judas held an office and he needs a replacement. And they choose Matthias by casting lots, it tells us in Acts chapter 1. And we might be thinking, you know, well, why are they casting lots to replace him? Well, again, if you're a Jew, you know that when the temple priests, you know, it was their turn to serve in the temple, they would cast lots to see who right. got what job. <laughs> right. Again, you got to know your Jewish heritage to understand how the Catholic Church works. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just not, they're, just, they're, just, they're not there gambling. That, that's what, right. what they did. It's, it, was, it was a cultural thing. So. <laughs> right. 
and you know, um, just like the Urim, Urim and Thummim, you know, that the Jews used to, uh, they considered that these holy objects were controlled by God and used them to make decisions. Casting lots was kind of like a way that they would allow God to choose what would happen because, you know, they would roll the dice and see whose number came up for what job. Um, let's see. Yeah. So even the King James Bible tells us that it referred to Judas's, Judas's office as a bishopric. Um, so the, for the King James only guys, you know, this is something you can point to and let them know that, you know, the Protestant pastor that's using the King James Bible is not a bishop and the apostles knew that their office was a bishopric and it had to be handed on to successors. You couldn't just put out a shingle and call your local building a church and invite people to come and listen to you preach. You got to have authority from the apostles. So the disciples handed on what Jesus taught them to the new Christians and some of what got taught was written down and we now have that in the New Testament. But because parchment was expensive and few people could read, most of the faith was passed on orally. The apostles didn't write down the New Testament and give everybody a copy because first of all, it all had to be handwritten and most people couldn't read that handwritten stuff anyway. So they preached to them. They told them about what Jesus taught. And so that's how the faith was passed on, not through a copy of the Bible, but by preaching with the authority from Jesus. And the oral tradition was supported later on by the written tradition. So the bishops would teach the people and uh, sometimes they would use what was written down by other apostles to support what they were teaching. Uh, the New Testament has like six authors in it, but there were 12 apostles Right. Uh, 13 if you want to count Paul, who also claims the office of an apostle and is accepted in, in that. Yet, you know, half of the guys didn't write anything that down that we have in the New Testament. Surely they preached things. Surely they wrote down stuff. And even, um, let's see, there's about, yeah, 13 books of the 27 books of the New Testament Paul, are written Paul. by Paul. And right. he wasn't even a guy that you know followed around with Jesus, right? And when you look to the when you look to tradition, I mean, Saint Thomas, we don't have any of his writings in the Bible, but what well, he took the faith to India and to some parts of the Middle East. Um, well, how about how about Saint Bartholomew? I mean, you hmm. can say, you say the same thing. They all obey Jesus's great commission, like we read in Matthew twenty-eight, to go and preach, baptize, and you know teach everything that Jesus taught them. But we don't have any of their writings, but obviously they still did. They still went. They still taught the gospel and, and took it to the known world. So it's exactly. a good point. It's a good point. Yeah. And uh, and even when it comes to Paul's writings, you know, in his letter to the Colossians, he said, you know, to exchange letters to the one he wrote to the Laodiceans. We don't have that in the New Testament. And in 1 Corinthians, he refers to an earlier letter that he wrote them. Right. We don't have that in the New Testament. So it's not like everything the apostles wrote automatically became part of the New Testament. Um, and not all of it was shared around. Um, at some point, the Catholic Church decided which writings would make up the New Testament. So we have to you know, recognize that the, the New Testament is the written tradition that supports the oral tradition. The oral tradition came first, the written tradition came second, and supports the oral tradition. But for Protestants, the idea that, you know, we're going to follow this oral tradition is a real tough thing because Martin Luther came up with this idea of sola scriptura, where you can only go by the Bible, the written tradition, because that's the only reliable thing we have. Um, but the oral tradition is what gives you the correct interpretation of the written tradition. 
And we know that the written tradition all by itself is not enough, um, as Martin Luther recognized at the end of his life. And you can open up um, any phone book if you can find one these days <laughs> and find a bunch of Protestant churches you know, that teach different things. In my own little town, uh, there's five different Protestant churches that teach different things. So obviously the written tradition alone is not enough. People disagree about how to interpret that. Um, let's see. So uh, even after Paul becomes an apostle, you know, after he's converted on his road to Damascus experience, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes that he went to Jerusalem to receive the right hand of fellowship from Peter, James, and John so that his preaching would not be in vain. Paul didn't you know, look at his letters and say, oh, this is what I'm supposed to teach the people because they weren't written yet <laughs> and they weren't authoritative yet. So, he, so in essence, he was authoritatively taught by Jesus' inner circle, if you will. Exactly. Okay. Um, so this shows that the authority to preach does not come from having a copy of the Bible. You have to get it from the church. Even Paul, who wrote about half of the New Testament, you know, had to go to the guys in Jerusalem, Peter, James, and John, to get authority to go out and preach because he wanted to make sure he's preaching the right thing. Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, written by Paul, he tells Timothy that the church is the pillar and foundation of truth, not the Bible. Um, now, Protestants like to point to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says all scripture is authoritative and useful for teaching, and say, see, you should go by the Bible. But if you back up just one verse, you find out that Paul tells Timothy, remember the scriptures of your youth. And what were the scriptures of Timothy's youth? Well, Timothy had a Greek father, lived in a Greek city, and had a Jewish mother. So his native language would have been Greek. The scriptures of Timothy's youth would have been the Greek Septuagint. Right. Translation of the Old Testament that has the books that are now missing from Protestant Bibles. So whenever a Protestant refers to 2 Timothy 3.16, take their Bible back up one verse and explain to them why this is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that includes the books that are now missing from their Bible. And not only that, Ken, but what, to that passage, as Catholics, we would say amen. Like, praise God, absolutely. But it has to do with the interpretation, and not only that, but the oral tradition that came first, because the Bible didn't come about till wasn't formulated until much later on after the church had already been going. Exactly. Yep. So. And also in uh, John's gospel, chapter 20 and 21, uh, he reminds the Christians that not everything is written down uh, and that nothing, you know, no book could hold everything that Jesus did and taught. Right. Um, and in uh, John chapter 20, it also, right after Jesus' resurrection, um, Jesus gives the apostles the authority to forgive sins, you know, which is an authority reserved to God alone. And uh, so this is, again, a passing on of authority from God to Jesus to the apostles. And let's see. So when the apostles went out and founded churches, they would appoint successors to themselves that we now call bishops by laying hands on them. And so from this, we understand that the authority comes from God to Jesus, to the apostles, to the bishops that they appoint. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy to be a good minister, to teach soundly, to not neglect the gift that was given through the laying on of hands on his hands. Paul reminds him again in 2 Timothy 1.6, 6, 
Remember the gift you received with the laying on of my hands, referring to when he made Timothy a bishop. Paul also warns Timothy to be careful about whom he lays hands on and shows how the faith. And this shows how the faith is passed on through the teachers, not just a book. He didn't give T Timothy a copy of the New Testament and said, OK, use this along with your Septuagint to teach the faith. Everything you need to know is in here because the New Testament hadn't even been fully written when Paul was passing this on to Timothy. And in Titus uh, chapter one, Paul reminds Titus that he left him in Crete to teach people rightly and appoint presbyters, uh, which later become bishops and that also have priestly duties in every town to properly hand on the faith. He doesn't tell Titus, here's a copy of the Bible and make sure everybody gets a copy. Paul tell, also tells Titus that the men he appoints should teach and appoint other men following the tradition of apostolic succession. So here we have authority from God to Jesus, to the apostles, to Paul, to Titus, who appoints successors, and they pass it on to other successors. But it's all apostolic. It's not just some guy who got a copy of the Bible and hung out a shingle. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11, and 11, Paul tells the Corinthians of the church practices, and he tells them that we have no other practices and neither do the churches of God. So unity in practice was expected among the early Christians. And in around 188 AD, I think it was, Hegesippus, he took a journey by land from Jerusalem to Rome and he traveled through all these different Christian towns. And he writes that, you know, everywhere he goes, they're teaching the same thing. Uh, we don't have Hegesippus's original writing, but Eusebius quotes him mm -hmm. in his ecclesiastical histories written in the early 300s. So that's how we know that um, Christianity had unified teaching back then. So these bishops continue to hold councils and give Holy Spirit inspired binding decrees to Christians uh, like the church leaders did in Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. Um, in Acts chapter 15, we have the Council of Jerusalem where there's a dispute in the church about how much of the Jewish law need, the Gentiles need to carry on with right. and the Jewish Christians are trying to push the works of the law on the Gentiles and the Gentiles are well first of all circumcision was a main factor that you know these adult Gentile <laughs> Christians were not up for that <laughs> I, I would agree yeah that'd be a problem <laughs> yeah uh, and then there's all the food laws and you know keeping the Sabbath and things like that um, and so when people are reading Paul, they always need to keep in mind that the Jewish Christians are trying to push the works of the law on the Gentile Christians. And these are the works that Paul is always telling these Christians don't save you. So when you read about the works that don't save you in Paul, it's the Jewish works of the law that don't save you. And uh, Genesis chapter 17 is where God required Abraham and all his descendants to be circumcised. So here was a law from God that the church in Acts chapter 15 decided was no longer binding. And this is something that we accept today. Uh, now Protestants might have a hard time, you know, agreeing that, you know, just because the church did that in Acts chapter 15, how does the church still have that today? Right. So we'll get into that. <laughs> so just as the interpretation of the Old Testament was passed on by the oral tradition um, through the rabbis, the oral tradition 
of the New Testament is also passed on. And we know the original oral tradition by reading the church fathers. When Protestants read the church fathers, they usually become Catholic because they don't find, <laughs> they don't find, you know, their Protestant version of Christianity in the early church. Right. You want to add some to that? That's what happened to me. Um, I, I, the big one for me, well, obviously was St. Justin Martyr giving his description of the mass and, you know, saying this bread we call Eucharist and only those who've been baptized are allowed to partake because we believe it's the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that same Jesus who died for us on the cross for our sins. And then St. Irenaeus later on saying, that every church has to agree with Rome because of her preeminent authority. That was like holy, you know, frying pans to the head for me, you know, when I was re reading these fathers. So yes, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> you know, it's it's right there in the history of the church. You know, if if you want to read it and be open to the truth, um, and let's see, did it, did it, did it, yeah, so. The interpretation of the Old Testament was passed on by oral tradition, and the interpretation of the New Testament is passed on by the apostles to the bishops that they ordained and onto the bishops that they ordained. And when the early church, you know, had disputes, they would have local councils that we refer to as synods um, to work out these disputes. Uh, one early synod that I refer to people to is in 251 AD, the church in Carthage, uh, they had a synod. And one of the things they discussed there was, do they have to wait till the eighth day to baptize the babies? Because that's when Jewish circumcision would occur. Again, that's the Jewish works of the law rolling into the New Testament. And that synod, one of their decision was that you don't have to wait until the eighth day to baptize the baby. You can baptize the baby anytime you want. Um, so again, this confirms infant baptism and that this was something that they discussed way back then. Um, a lot of people are confused about infant baptism. You know, why isn't, you know, specifically mentioned in the New Testament? Because the first Christians were Jews and they circumcised their male babies at eight days old. You know, they already was, understood that. <laughs> and that was becoming part of God's covenant family when you were circumcised at eight days old. Mm -hmm. so. You know, it was so natural and uh, common to them that they didn't need to write about it. But um, modern Protestants thinking that we can only go by what is written in the New Testament, you know, they want to see where baptizing babies is, is in the Bible. And other than household baptisms that would include babies, it isn't specifically there because they didn't need to write about it. Everybody right. knew that's what you do. So while the New Testament is still being written um, somewhere between you know, 70 and 90 AD, the church in Corinth had another dispute same church that Paul had to write two letters to, at least. And when they had this dispute, do they uh, look in their Bible to find out what to do about it? No, they wrote to the church in Rome. And Clement, the bishop of Rome, writes back to them that he's going to send a delegation to their church to help sort this out. Um, but the church in Corinth knew where the higher authority was when they had a dispute in Rome. They didn't write to the church in Jerusalem. They didn't write to the church in Antioch. They wrote to the church in Rome. And, you know, some people might say that, well, maybe they wrote to Jerusalem and maybe they wrote to Antioch. But the letter that got preserved and handed on is Rome. the one, <laughs> the answer from Rome, not Antioch or Jerusalem. So, at least they decided to listen to Rome, even if they wrote to Jerusalem or Antioch, even though that's just uh, speculation, not something that we have any evidence for. It's just a, right. a possibility. <laughs> right, right. And in Clement's letter that he writes, uh, he refers to the offices of bishop, priest, and deacons. 
So we know that very early on in the church, these exist. Um, and Paul writes about bishops and deacons. Um, he doesn't specifically mention priests, but you know the things that Paul writes about are priestly duties like confecting the Eucharist, uh, forgiving sins, and things like that. You know, having authoritative teaching. Um, in 107 AD, Ignatius, who's the third bishop in Antioch after Peter and Evodius, he writes that the teachings of the church are passed on through the bishops, not a book. And Ignatius writes that wherever the bishop is, there is the Catholic church. Just like for the Jews, wherever the rabbi is, that's where the synagogue is. And the early Christian communities were patterned after the synagogue communities, were a group of, you know, like-minded people following the same faith tradition, you know, looked after each other and got together every week to learn about the faith mm -hmm. and practice their religion. And as you previously mentioned, um, in 180 AD, Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon, he wrote a five volume volume book against heresies and we have to understand well who's this Irenaeus guy well Irenaeus he learned the faith from Polycarp well who's Polycarp he's the guy who learned the faith from the apostle John right so we have the authority from God to Jesus to John to Polycarp to Irenaeus the teaching was handed on from person to person the interpretation of what would later become the Bible was handed on from person to person. And uh, let's see, Irenae Irenaeus writes that if two churches have a doctrinal dispute, they need to see which church can trace its history back to an apostle. So if your church is founded by an apostle, most likely you have apostolic teaching. Now, if two churches can be traced back to an apostle, he says, all you need to do is find out what the church in Rome teaches, because all other churches have to be in agreement with that church because they have the teaching of Peter and Paul, because they both ended their days in Rome. Um, so we have later ecumenical councils where the bishops and priests get together to hammer out doctrines for the church and rules for the church. The first one is the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Right. And then while Christianity was still illegal, there were local synods, you know, here and there that hammered out doctrine for those local churches. And then in 325 AD, now that Christianity is legal, uh, Emperor Constantine calls the council for the church to all get on the same page. Um, one of the major disputes at this time was Arius was teaching that Jesus is not co-eternal with the Father. So right. Const Constantine calls this council in 325 in Nicaea and they hammer out doctrine for the church. And just like the doctrine for the church in the Council of Jerusalem of Acts chapter 15 is binding on the whole church, the, bind, the decisions of the Council of Nicaea are binding on the whole church. And the Arians didn't want to agree with the decision of the council, so they kept teaching their heresy secretly or not so openly, um, and just like the Jews that didn't want to agree with the decision of the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, and still kept trying to push the Jewish works of the law, uh, the Arians still kept pushing their Arian form of Christianity. And we see that it's still around in the Jehovah Witness Church yes. these yes. days. <laughs> And I guess you can't even call the Jehovah Witnesses a church because they're just a. Uh, well, well, we could just say that Ar Arianism lives on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. in, in, in several forms. Yes. Um, so, so, Ken, I mean, we, we talk about 
so you went from Genesis through Revelation. You went through ov- part of the early church already. So obviously this is something that God has kind of established. He's kind of set the groundwork for it way back when in Genesis. How does the magisterium work today? Right. Well, we still have a pope, and we still have bishops, and we still have priests and deacons, um, and they still provide guidance for the church. You know, the the pope provides you know everyday guidance. Um, the councils provide overall guidance, and uh, our local bishops or archbishops provide guidance for their church. Here in the United States, we have the United States Council of Catholic Bishops, where the most of the bishops get together and decide, you know, what are going to be the overall policies for the Catholic Church in the United States. And other countries may have their local have their local traditions or practices, um, but they all have to be within the uh, doctrinal teachings of the Catholic Church. You know, you can't go too far afield. Um, in the United States, we have the general instruction of the Roman Missal that dictates how the Mass is done, and that's how the Mass has to be done in the U.S. if it's in the Latin Rite. Um, if it's an Eastern Rite Church, they have their own established doctrines there, and they're not supposed to deviate from that either. Um, Still people, you know, our clergy do get it wrong sometimes. You know, they want to do kind of their own thing. And it's up to the bishop, their bishop, to keep those priests on track. And the bishops are also the administrators of their diocese or part of a diocese, depending on how big your diocese is. And it's not always easy for them to keep track of everything. Um, just like our local pastors of our local church, you know, they're administering at the church, trying to say mass, visit the sick. And, you know, if you have a good active parish, you know, where you have assorted different um, religious groups doing different things, you know, they're trying to be involved in that too. So our priests are very overworked. <laughs> oh, so, yes. We need yeah. to do all we can to help them. <laughs> right, absolutely. Now, as far as as far as the magisterium goes, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's the it's the teaching authority. There, you know, you have to keep the teaching on track. You can't deviate and say that all of a sudden Arianism is right. We got it wrong way back in 325. That right. can't happen, right? Exactly. You know, once okay. once the Catholic Church establishes a doctrine and makes that become a dogma, that is a required belief, a required practice, a required understanding to be a Catholic. If you sign up to be a Catholic, you sign up to agree with the doctrines and dogmas of the Catholic Church. Um, Now, doctrines can evolve. Um, Dogmas, you know, once once they're set in stone, they are set in stone. You know, the Catholic Church can't start teaching that, you know, Jesus isn't really present in the Eucharist anymore because we got that wrong. You know, that's a dogma of the Catholic Church that the real presence is there. We can perhaps further define it, although um, it seems pretty well defined now. I'm not sure how else you can define it. (laughs) Right. Are are, are there any examples of doctrines developing? And I I, I say this because I want to make sure that our listeners understand that when the magisterium rules on dogma, it is what it is. It's never going to change. I just want to establish that rule clearly. Right. Um, well, in 1950, I believe it was, uh, the Catholic Church, well, the Pope declared that Mary was assumed into heaven and made that a dogma. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's not like, you know, all of a sudden this Pope decided that, Mary was assumed into heaven, and everybody has to believe that. Uh, as far back as 120 AD, <laughs> 120 AD. <laughs> Beginning like, of the church. Ink is yeah. just drying on the New yeah. Testament. <laughs> right. Uh, 
the there was a, a Catholic who wrote about um, Mary being assumed into heaven. And in Revelation chapter 12, we find a woman in heaven who gives birth to the man child that will rule with a rod of iron, which we know is Jesus. So we know that Mary is in heaven and John saw her there. And there's no church on earth that claims to have the relics of Mary. We're, we have plenty of church that claim to have the relics of an apostle. So that is, you know, something that, you know, was understood by the church way back in 120 AD and written by uh, Catholic theologians over the years, but made a required belief by the Catholic church in 1950. But again, it wasn't just made up out of whole cloth. It was understood right. from the beginning. Right, and I think that's I think that's important to understand, though, Ken. As far as the magisterium goes, the magisterium just isn't going to make something up willy nilly and say, "Poof, here it is. You got to believe this, or you got to believe that." Um, all of a sudden, the letter of Clement that you mentioned earlier is now part of Scripture. Now we got to reprint the Bible to get that in there. Right. That's not that's not going to happen. It, I mean, the Scripture is what it is at this point. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. Although the Council of Trent, you know established that, you know, these are the books of the Bible, um, but it didn't say that these are the only books of the Bible. You know, the canon is still perhaps, shall we say, open, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, like if we were to reunify with the Orthodox that have third and fourth Maccabees right. in their set of scriptures, you know, we could add them to the Catholic Old Testament, um, or you know, we could agree with the Orthodox and say that you know these are useful for teaching, but we're not going to read them during the liturgy of the Word at Mass. Um, just like you know, First Clement was read during the liturgy of the Word at Mass in many early churches, mm -hmm. but didn't make it into the New Testament. Uh, these third and fourth Maccabees could make it into the Old Testament, but not be read at Mass, because it's useful for teaching, but not for reading as inspired scripture, no. shall we say. Sure. Um, but some people kind of wonder about the office of cardinals. And, yes. You know, where did that come from? Right, because you don't see that in the Bible at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> no little red birds in the Bible. <laughs> right. Um, but the the office of the cardinal, um, you know, kind of first appears historically around 1059 when the clergy around Rome or in Rome and the like seven neighboring dioceses around Rome um kind of like stepped up and said, okay, we're the guys that are going to decide who the next Pope will be. Um, and the term cardinal comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge. And since the Pope is the head of the church, the, the Pope is kind of like a hinge of the church. You know, when you change the Pope, it's like, you're moving from one part to another and it allows the church to kind of swing like a hinge. Um, but what we don't want to do is for that hinge to move too far. Right. And some popes are, you know, better at carrying on the apostolic tradition than others. And some want to reform the church more into something like they want it to be. Which is why, you know, the cardinals get together and, you know, really debate about, you know, who is going to be the successor of the current pope. Um, when the early clergy in 1059 was deciding, you know, who the next pope would be, it wasn't just bishops, it was bishops, priests, and deacons. Um, and in the 12th century, 
um, the practice of appointing uh, ecclesi ecclesiastics from outside of Rome as cardinals began. So in the 1100s, you know, uh, bishops from outside of the neighborhood of Rome started being added to the group, added to the group of cardinals. And in, let's see, 1917, the code of canon law was uh, changed to require that to be a cardinal, you at least had to be a priest. And in 1962, Pope John the 23rd introduced the requirement that to be a cardinal, you have to be a bishop. So no more deacons or priests were appointed to cardinal after 1962. And most likely all the previous priests and deacons that were Cardinals have since died off. Um, I would assume, that yeah. we're 60 years later. So the Cardinals are kind of like the princes of the church, just like a prince would assist the king uh, in a kingdom. The Cardinals assist the Pope. And the Pope has his curia, which are the Cardinals that were with him there in Rome. And they have different areas of responsibility because, you know, the Pope can't do everything. You know, if our priest in our local parish is overwhelmed with work, you know, imagine the Pope trying to run the church worldwide. He needs help. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Oh. And in my diocese of Detroit here in Michigan, um, we've had some archbishops that have also been cardinals. Um, and helped out with the church on a, a larger basis. Um, so the in the state of Michigan, you know, the Archdiocese of Detroit is the most populous diocese of the Catholic Church. And so we have an archbishop and a bishop, you know, other bishops and even what are referred to as assistant bishops. Mm -hmm. um, because our archbishop can't go to all the parishes for confirmation, right. um, so he sends assistants. And if our local archbishop does well enough, he can move up to being a cardinal. But that doesn't mean he moves to Rome. He's just a cardinal outside of Rome. And when a pope would be, when the occasion would come to elect a new pope, he would go to Rome to help elect the new pope. And in the Catholic Church, um, it has been developed that you have to be a cardinal under the age of 80 to be able to vote for the successor of the previous pope. So um, the Catholic Church does that you know, as kind of like guide rails to uh, keep you know old senile guys from voting for a guy that doesn't really qualify as being the Pope. Um, because we all know as we get older, we don't think as well as we used to. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the cardinals that work with the Pope there in Rome, you know, they establish canon law. Um, they provide guidance for the church. There's a cardinal that serves as like the secretary of state for the Catholic Church and visits the leaders of other countries representing the Pope, things like that. So we it all comes down to authority and we have to remember where the authority comes from. And no matter how many times Protestants wanna claim that the authority from God comes to us through the Bible, it actually comes from God to Jesus to the apostles and passed on to the bishops. And the Bishop of Rome was recognized from the very beginning of the church as the head of all the other bishops. Um, even in, let's see, I think it was the, yeah, the Council of Constantinople, I think. Yeah, the Bishop of Constantinople wanted to claim um, authority over all the Eastern churches, 
but even at that point in 385 AD, he recognized that his authority was second to the Bishop of Rome. <laughs> so way back in 385, the Bishop of Constantinople knows his place. And the uh, when the idea was floated that the, the Bishop of Constantinople would be over the Bishop of Rome, all the bishops of the other Eastern Patriarchal churches like Antioch and Jerusalem, they said, whoa, 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 whoa. The Bishop right. of Rome is the head, not the Bishop of Constantinople. Just because Constantine has moved the capital to Constantinople doesn't mean that the Bishop of Constantinople now becomes the Pope over the whole church. So it's very hard for us modern Americans to accept authority from higher up people. Um, we have our laws in the US that were free to break as long as we don't get caught. <laughs> but we always have to remember that, you know, God's moral law, you know, just because a priest doesn't see you do it or a bishop sees you do it or your local pastor doesn't see you do it, God knows what you did and you will be held accountable. Um, no matter what you do in darkness or not under the supervision of the law, whether God's law or man's law, you will be held accountable for that on Judgment Day. Nobody right. escapes God's judgment. Um, Protestants that are taught that they have imputed righteousness from Jesus while they're still sinners, you know, God knows what you did, and you can't hide behind Jesus because God can't be fooled. God knows what you did. God knows if you're a sinner. And we all need to repent and follow God's law. So we have to recognize that Jesus, um, well, the Jews had an authoritative church like the kingdom of David, and that kingdom carries on with one head in heaven, Jesus, and on earth, the Pope, and the cardinals that serve the Pope, and our local bishops, and our priests that serve the local bishops, uh, and serve us. So we have to know our place in the hierarchy and we laity in the church. We are like the fingers and the feet of the church, but we're not the head of the church. And the head of the church is not the Bible that the church later assembled. It's the Bishop of Rome who does things under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, just like in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And when he teaches authoritatively, that's the authority we need to listen to. All right, good stuff. And a lot more we can go into, but mm -hmm. yeah, Ken, you did a great job. Thank you for sharing everything, especially all this stuff in scripture. I didn't even think about going all the way back to Genesis on that. So that's very enlightening. So your book, How Old Is Your Church? How, how is it doing and where can our listeners get a hold of it? Yeah. Well, uh, sales continue to trickle in. <laughs> it's only $6. You can buy it on Amazon. Uh, if you're in RCIA, it's a great book, you know, as supplemental material, because I answer a lot of common Protestant questions. Um, I have a collection of 200 writings, and there's only 25 of them in my book. So if you want the other 175 plus writings, just send me an email at kenlitchfield61 at gmail.com. I'll send you off the whole batch for free. Um, and if you just want the, the Cliff Notes version, get my book, How Old Is Your Church, on Amazon. And if you can't afford to buy it on Amazon, send me an email. I'll email you a free PDF copy. And what's your email, Ken, so they, they know that? Again, it's Ken Litchfield at uh, Ken Litchfield 61 at gmail.com. Right. Well, Ken, thanks for coming on today. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and thanks for everything you're doing out there. Thanks for having me, William. Uh, really enjoy doing this kind of stuff, and uh, it makes life worthwhile for me. <laughs>
that's a lot of fun. All right. God bless you, Ken. Take care. God bless. Bye.